Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. Thank you again for being with us. I want to get straight into the book of Psalms today. Chapter 81, beginning with verse 4. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. All right, so we, we, we have rules, okay? God has rules. I know the world doesn't like that today, and many Christians, oh, God doesn't have rules. God does have rules. He had made it a decree in Joseph, and it went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. All right. So God said, I delivered you from slavery. He said, I took the burden off of your shoulder. I took the basket out of your hand. In your distress, you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and and I will fill it. Now look at that last verse in, in New Living. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. Now that's not a verse I've ever preached on much. But they used to sing that song in Korea. And Dr. Cho used to preach that verse a lot. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God was speaking to people who had come out of slavery. (laughs) Open wide and I will fill it. God will fill your mouth with good things. God will fill your life with good things. God will give you good food to eat. God will give you good things to drink. God will give you delicious things to eat and drink. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Father, I lift to you your people today. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of teaching the people again how that you would prosper them, how that you would provide for them. Jesus, how you redeemed them, how you redeemed them from the curse of the law that the blessings of Abraham could flow into their life. Jesus, I thank you for all that you have done, breaking the curse of poverty off of the lives of your people. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, continue to lift the heads of your people. Let them have the hope of prosperity. Let their faith grow for it to be well with them, Lord, for their family to have plenty of food on the table and the bills paid, Lord, and a good roof over their head. Father, in these days when it's hard for public transportation, especially with the social distancing, Lord, I ask for transportation for the families. I ask for cars. I ask for motorcycles. These things are needs today, Lord, to get to work, to do their jobs. Father, provide. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name for tuition fees to be paid. And not just borrowing from relatives, Lord, and then living behind, trying to play catch-up. Father, bring your people into daily bread living, where they always live out of provision in advance, where they always live out of their bodega. Father, let every family move away from hand to mouth. Let every family move into bodega living. I thank you for it. Lord, we can't go and meet all the needs of the people, but you can Lord, you are the God who provides. You are the God who is more than enough. Let your provision flow to every family. Lord, I thank you for all the promotions. I thank you for all the new jobs. I thank you for all that you've done, Lord. You've done so much for the people, Lord. You've you've made ways where there was no way. (laughs) Lord, we we walk around thinking Waymaker all the day, all day long when we see what you have done and we hear the testimonies day by day and minute by minute sometimes as they come in. But Father, for every family, Lord, for every family, let provision flow that they will live out of their bodega as they open their mouth wide, Lord, not just a little bit, <laughs> as they open their mouth wide, Lord, fill it. Fill their mouth with good things. Fill their life with good things, Father. I thank you. 
I thank you for all of your faithfulness. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness. Faithful are you who have promised. I thank you for that faithfulness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Old Testament passage today picks up in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven. Now, there's several things I want you to notice when he'd finished. Have you ever thought, sometimes God waits for us to finish Sometimes he, I've enjoyed listening to your prayer. Now I'm going to answer, but I enjoyed listening to it, so I waited for you to finish. Sometimes God sends the answer while we're still praying. But sometimes he's enjoyed being prayed to. He finished his prayer. Fire came down from heaven, came down at the dedication of of tabernacle in the wilderness. It came down at the uh, Mount Moriah sacrifice with David, showing the choice of Mount Moriah as the place of the new temple. It came down here at the first temple. It came down again on the day of Pentecost. Again, showing God's acceptance, both of the individual and the local church as the temple of God. And consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the house of God because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I like that. But all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord in the temple. They bowed with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to God, saying, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. <laughs> this is great worship. Some of the favorite things I say in prayer is, God, you're good and your love endures forever. Oh, God, everything you do is good and everything you say is good. <laughs> it's wonderful worship. This is a phrase that you, you just need to memorize and learn. It's a wonderful thing to say in prayer and worship. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. Grabe. I can't even imagine how long that would take. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Notice all the people. The priests stood at their post, the Levites also with the instruments for music to the Lord that David had made for giving thanks to the Lord. Now, this is, there's something that you hear is often referred to as Davidic worship. This was not part of Moses, okay? This is not part of the, of the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law. This is different. David added this beautiful instrumental worship as part of, of the temple. And David had made this. And sometimes you, you look at that and you go, wow. And then you remember David will be the one leading worship as the prince in the temple of God during the millennial reign. David will be leading the worship. David was a worshiper. I mean, David Telegong was a worshiper. And Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered the burnt offerings and the fat and peace offerings, because the bronze altar Solomon had made could not hold the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat. They, they actually had to make another altar. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days and all Israel with him, a very great assembly, from Lebo Hamath to the book of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly, for they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for the prosperity that the Lord had granted to David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I love that. Joyful and glad of heart for the prosperity for the prosperity that the Lord had granted to King David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. As God prospers you, 
your emotion should not be one of guilt because somebody wants to make you feel guilty because of what you have. Your emotions, these are the emotions of prosperity. Joyful and glad of heart. When God gives you your dream home, he wants you to be joyful and glad of heart. When God gives you that business, he wants you to be joyful and glad of heart. When God gives you that new car, he wants you to be joyful and glad of heart. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, all right, so he appeared. This is another theophany. And said, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Okay, this is a house of sacrifice. Literally, we could say a house of offerings. <laughs> a house of offerings. This, this is where the offerings will be made to worship me. Wow. A house of offering. Now, you know, if you preach that, people would really get mad at you. I've chosen this place. Chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice, as a house of offerings. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That is his promise. Now if my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer play, prayed at this place, this is what I call a Western Wall prayer. You wonder why the people of Israel write their requests and stick them in the prayer wall? Well, he said, my eyes and my ears. He sees the prayers and he hears the praise, prayers prayed in that place. That's why I love to pray there. I know God hears us everywhere, but there's something about knowing. He said his eyes would be open. As I sit there every year, and we haven't been now for a while, but as I sit there every year, we go through all those prayer requests. Sometimes you send 10 or 12,000 with us at a time. And we read them one by one. Each name we read. Each name we read. I read the first prayer request. Sometimes Sister Bev reads more than that, okay? But I read the first one because that's what I promised you that I would do. And I ask you to just write one. This verse is always in my mind, in my heart. God, your eyes are open. You, you see this request that our people wrote in faith. And we brought all the way from Manila. And now we sit here at this wall and we pray toward the place you said your eyes would always be open and your ears would always be open to. It's a, it's a beautiful place to pray. For I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Now, did you hear that? All time. Even in 2021. You know, the Western Wall is such a beautiful place for us to pray. We've been taking tour groups over there for so many years now. And one of the things I love about our people going is, yes, they do their shopping and stuff, but almost every night, a large group, and I'm not talking a small group, I'm talking about a large group of our people, go down to pray at the Western Wall at night. It's a very beautiful place to pray at night, and it's so quiet and peaceful. They know God, eyes, and God's heart is there while they pray. It's a special place to pray. And as for you, if you walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I coveted with David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. Now notice, if, here's conditional promises again, You know, we always have to remember there are promises and then there are conditional promises. 
But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you and this house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb and a byword among the people. And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster upon them. Chapter 8, verse 1. At the end of 20 years, in which Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house. Now notice, 20 years. It takes a while to build something great. Solomon rebuilt the cities that Hiram had given to him and settled the people of Israel in them. And Solomon went to Hamath Zoboah and took it. And he built Tadmor in the wilderness and all the storehouses that he built in Hamath. He also built Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon fortified cities with walls, gates, and bars. And at Baalath, and all the store cities that Solomon had, and all the cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen. And whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion, all the people who were left of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of Israel, from their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel had not destroyed, these Solomon drafted as forced labor, and so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves for his work. They were soldiers, his officers, and commanders of his chariots and his horsemen. And these were the chief officers of King Solomon, 250, who exercised authority over the people. So he ruled, he ruled with 250 chief leaders. He ruled the nation with 250 leaders. Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter up from the city of David to the house he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not live in the house of David, king of Israel. For the, place t- for the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. So here you see Solomon began to separate his life of sin from his holy life. Now, there's a principle that you're going to see in Solomon's life. Solomon was very good at what I would call compartmentalization. He compartmentalized his life. This is my holy life and this is my sinful life. He should have never been married to her. But at least out of respect for God, he separated what was sinful away from that which was holy. Now, in the end of his life, the compartmentalization broke down. And this is something I've watched in many people who are very good at their little compartmentalization. They've never learned to live a unified life. But as they get older, the compartmentalization breaks down. And you see the the alcohol moving into their everyday life, whereas it used to be they just did it when they traveled. You, you see the girls begin to move into their everyday life where it used to be just when they traveled. You, the compartmentalization breaks down. Never compartmentalize your life. Live a unified, holy life by the grace of God. Then Solomon offered a burnt offering to the Lord on the altar of the Lord that he had built before the festival. As the duty of each day required, offering according to the commandment of Moses for the Shabbat, for the Shabbats, the new moons, and the three annual feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. According to the ruling of David his father, he appointed the division of the priests for their service and the Levites for their offices of praise and ministry before the priests as the duty of each day required, and the gatekeepers in their divisions at each gate. For so David the man of God had commanded. All right, so David organized David laid out structure and duties. Now, Solomon didn't try to reinvent the wheel. David, my father, laid out these structures. He laid out these duties. He laid out these job descriptions, and we're going to continue to follow them. And they did not turn aside from what the king had commanded the priests and the Levites concerning any matter and concerning the treasuries. 
Thus was accomplished all the work of Solomon from the day the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was completed. Then Solomon went to Ezion Geber and to Eloth on the shore of the sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent to him by the hand of his servants ships and servants familiar with the sea. And they went to Ophir together with the servants of Solomon. And they brought from there 450 talents of gold and brought it to King Solomon. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. Having a very great retinue, in other words, she brought a whole entourage with her, and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stone. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from Solomon that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, the attendance of his servants and their clothing, his cupbearers and their clothing, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came, and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You surpass the report that I have heard. Happy are your wives. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and has set you on his throne as a king for the Lord your God. Because the Lord God loved Israel and would establish them forever, he has made you king over them that you may execute justice and righteousness. All right. Why did God choose a good king? God's choice. Why? Because he loved Israel. He said, I'm going to give you a good king, a wise king, because I love you. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. And there were no spices such as those that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Moreover, the servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon, who brought gold from Ophir, brought algam wood and precious stones. And the king made from the algam wood supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, lyres also and harps for the singers. And there, was, there never was seen the like of them before in the land. Now the algam wood, this is a very strong, hard wood. This, this, is, this is not a weak wood. This is a very strong, hard wood. So it makes great supports for God's house. So notice, he improved the temple. The temple was built, but he improved it. And he improved his house. Well, I'll call it his palace, all right? He improved his palace. He got better materials. He improved things. The queen and the king Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked besides what she had brought to the king. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Now that's not the Antichrist. Besides that, there which the explorers and merchants brought, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the lands brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields with beaten gold and 600 shekels of beaten gold went into each shield. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold, 300 shekels of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. And the king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with gold. And the throne had six steps and a footstool of gold, which was attached to the throne. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. While twelve lions stood there, one on each end of the step of the six steps, nothing like it had ever been made for any kingdom. Now, you you can imagine the steps going up. Six steps, and on each step there are two lions. Wow, you talk about a throne. That would have been a really cool throne. Overlaid in solid gold. Made of pure ivory. You can't even imagine something like that today. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. Silver, well, parang basura. (laughs) 
Now, I, I want you to see something here. I want you to see that all Israel was lifted in prosperity. The whole standard of living of the whole nation rose so that, ah, eh, silver is nothing. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God, which God put in his mind. So the source of wisdom. Every one of them brought his present, articles of silver and of gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. He made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. The horses were imported for Solomon from Egypt and from all the lands. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, from first to last, are they not written in the history of Nathan the prophet and the prophecy of Hahijah, the Shilonite, and of the visions of Edo, the seer, concerning Jeroboam and the, the son of Nabat. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel forty years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. That's some beautiful truth there today. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captain, good news for the shame.
Our New Testament passage today picks up in Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. Paul said, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. All right, now, now just get a hold of that, believers. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean that we can sin. All right? As Christians, we do not live in sin. Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? All right? So you can become a slave again. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. I like that. We have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. All right, so there's a standard of teaching. There's a, an ethics presented. And having been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. I like that, slaves of living right. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, all right, so notice when you yield to sin, you sin more. When you yield yourself to sin, you sin more, leading to more unrighteousness. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. I like that. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart from sin to God for a holy purpose. I like that. For when you were once slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Okay, there was no righteousness in you. For what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Now remember what eternal life is, John, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. This is eternal life that they may know you, know you by experience, the one true God, and know by experience the son that you have sent. So, all right, when you, you become slaves to God, there's a fruit of living right. Sanctification and encounters with God. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift. <laughs> wages. When you sin, you get what you've earned. In forgiveness, we get a gift. Chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Now, th this is why you've heard me teach people, ladies, if your husband dies, you can get remarried. Guys, if your wife dies, you can get remarried. And I, I can remember years ago when I first began to tell people that, oh, families were scandalized. They're not being loyal to, to my son. They're not being loyal to my brother or my sister. Well, no. Released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she shall be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. There's no adultery if you get remarried after your sour dies. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. He said, all right, you've died to the law. Now you belong to another. You belong to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit to God. I, I like that. I belong to him. I belong to Jesus. I belong to him in order that we may bear fruit to to God. What a beautiful thought. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. 
fruit for death. Death means separation. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We serve in grace. We serve in this new way of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, not, not just controlled by rules and regulations. It's a beautiful new covenant. Amen. Now, let's close out today with Proverbs, a little bit of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. Okay. So wisdom and insight will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. If you embrace wisdom, if you embrace wisdom, she will exalt you and she will honor you. But you have to embrace wisdom. She will place a garland, place on your head a graceful garland. This is victory. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. This is leadership. These are the blessings of wisdom. Say, Pastor, where's the best place to get wisdom? Well, on your knees, because any man who lacks wisdom, the Bible said, let him ask and God will give to us richly without reproach. But also the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter one, talk to us about this is where the purpose of Proverbs is to give us wisdom. This is why you should read Proverbs every day. All right, we'll see you tonight, seven o'clock for the evening service. 